This is the uh, February 18th, uh, 2021 select board meeting. I'll uh, call this meeting to order. If uh, the uh, assistant town administrator could please uh, read the agenda. Okay, good evening. So the board meeting tonight and before we start, they can approve the agenda as presented or amended. There'll be a public comment if there is any. And item number one is the consent agenda, which includes the payroll warrant. The next select board meeting dates are March 4th and March 18th. The next police chief search committee meetings of February 25th, March 11th, and March 25th. Then there'll be an update from the COVID-19 team. And then there'll be a joint appointment with the Sherburn School Committee. Um, this is an appointment for a term to expire at the May 2021 town election. There were three candidates that applied and were interviewed by the school committee. Then there will be a consideration of appointment to the Sherburn Arts Council for Jennifer Lynn Devon for a term to expire on February 18th, 2024. Item number four is a brief update on the community choice aggregation process and next steps. Greg Kennan, Fred Cunningham, Michael Lesser, Andrew Lauterbach from the Energy Committee will be here. Then item number five is a consideration of FY22 omnibus budgets and warrant articles. Chris Candy from the building department will be here to present his budget. The select board and select board legal budgets will be presented tonight. The finance and town accountant budgets will be presented tonight. Charles Tyler Warren from the recycling committee will be here to present his budget and Douglas Brody, our veterans agent will present his budget. Item number six is consideration of annual town meeting and election date. Jackie Morris, the town clerk will be here. Number seven is to review the warrant checklist for the annual town meeting. Number eight is a, a departmental space needs, a discussion that was asked to be put on the agenda by the select board from our last meeting. Item number nine is the consideration of administration items and routine business, select board reports and continuation of goals and staff reports. And then the board will go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to threatened potential litigation if the chair so declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the select board and the town and the chair does so declare to discuss the town library pursuant to mass general law chapters 30a sections 21a 3 and 7 and suffolk construction versus dkm 449 mass 444 parentheses 2007 Item number two will be a discussion regarding public records request for executive session minutes pursuant to general law chapter 30A, section 21A, 7 and general law chapter 30A, section 22G2 and strategy session to prepare for negotiations with non-union personnel town administrator pursuant to general law chapter 30A, section 21A and 2. Thank you very much, Diane. Yep. Um, are there any modifications uh, or any uh, motions relative to the agenda? I'll we'll move to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Second by whomever, Jeff or Paul, whatever Diane writes down. Okay, all in favor, Jeff? Aye. George? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. Okay, first agenda item. Number one, consent agenda. Any uh, motions or questions relative to the consent agenda? Move approval. Okay. Second. Second by Jeff. All in favor, Jeff? Aye. George? Aye. Paul? I and I am I as well. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. We're going on to the COVID nineteen update. I think Jeff has indicated that uh, Zach had to uh, had to leave the meeting. I believe uh, Daryl's here. Hi, Daryl. Is there Hi. Uh, anything uh, new or relevant uh, on this subject? Zach wanted to let you know that the fire department um, personnel have all received their second doses. Mm -hmm. And so before I give a few little tidbits. Are there any particular questions that people have? Because I never really know what people want to know about this uh, since we spend all week on it. <laughs> so if you don't have anything in particular. All right, so a couple little updates. I'm sure people have heard about the expansion to over 65, uh, but also that the the system is having some trouble, so people might want to just wait a bit. 
until that settles down. They're trying to work on that um, to improve best as I understand. Um, uh, from news from the White House is so since the change in administration, they've gone from 8.6 million doses being distributed around the country. They're up to 13.5 or so per week, million per week distributed to all the states. Uh, they've been able to use the Defense Production Act a little more effectively to help boost those numbers and they're going to continue to do so. As I mentioned before, they're still working on the um, kind of a separate stream is to work with pharmacies, not going to impact us in the same way, but they are trying to utilize pharmacies and community health centers to deal with equity issues and ease of access for certain groups. And the pharmacies have been doing pretty well under that uh, program. And it's also to help with later on and uh, again, distributing to people who may not have the ability to drive to a location, which probably does not apply to Sherborne quite as much as some other parts of the state. Uh, the statistics are always changing, of course, but uh, the rollout has been going pretty well in Massachusetts uh, per capita. We were recently number one for states with greater than 5 million um, in population and number nine overall, again, in per capita vaccination rates, and also uh, first in over 75 vaccination. Um, and we're getting up to around 135 plus thousand a week uh, in doses. Let's see, what else? Been talking to Woodhaven about um, you know, possible changes there, use of the community room, that sort of thing. So I see that there's some energy committee <laughs> folks here might wanna be talking to you about some ideas that we discussed today, but I'll, I'll get in touch with your committee on that. So that's kind of a quick summary. Hey, thank you very much, Daryl. Um, are there any questions from the board? How about from the general public? Any questions from the general public? I will add that uh, some of the changes that you'll be seeing too is because of the importance of getting people vaccinated as quickly as possible, in part because of the variants of the virus that are emerging, the state is shifting emphasis to the sites that can operate at high volume and very efficiently and then reserve some of the smaller sites for those special cases I talked about. And they also, oh, should let people know they have a, they're developing a program for homebound indiv individuals or others who really can't go to these mass vaccination sites. So that should be forthcoming soon. Um, as part of that, they are restricting much more, uh, distribution of vaccines to sites that can handle at least 750 people per, per day, five days a week. So some communities that had planned to do the small scale will not necessarily be able to do that. Okay. And yeah, again, it's because of the drive to just get people vaccinated more quickly, which was again, part of the reasoning that we were not pursuing it here in Sherborne. I heard something similar to that. that makes sense. Um, sorry, I'm mixing up my agendas. All right, thank you much. Um, if there's no other questions uh, from the public or for the select board, I'll move on to agenda item number three. Excuse me one second as I try to scram my own stuff. That's a school committee appointment and joint appointment with the Sherbin School Committee. Um, the appointments for a term to expire in the May 2021 um, election. So who's taking the lead on this? Is this Diane? Uh, Eric, Jackie, Angie J Johnson is here tonight, and George. Yeah, I went to the, just as a select board member, just to start, I'd like to say I, I attended their meeting um, last week where they interviewed the candidates. 
So I sat in on their interviews with all three candidates. Very impressive group. I was very impressed to see three strong candidates all apply for, for an open position. So, so that was good. And I think the school committee did a wonderful job interviewing them and asking some very important questions. Um, I would like to, I know Angie sent an email earlier, but I'd like to hear from Angie the recommendation from the school committee and then I'll share kind of my, my thoughts as well from the interview and then go from there. As George said, I'm Angie Johnson from the Sherburn School Committee and we had three candidates apply and I have to say I was duly impressed. We have people with prior experience, we have people with kids in our school, people with kids who are about to start school and they all came with differing perspectives um, from professional and personal lives as well as um, interactions with schools. So with that being said, um, we are going to recommend that Dennis Quant be nominated and accepted for this uh, three month period. Um, that being said, at the end of that period, um, that seat is up for election. We also have, you know, all the time members who roll on and roll off. So anyone who is interested, and I do hope that people will continue because I think the whole point of this democratic process is to get people to challenge and to come in. And to me, it was absolutely fantastic. So that is the recommendation of the Sherburn School Committee. And um, George, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I was impressed with the with the interviews. And I, I think they're making a, my opinion is they're making a right recommendation. One thing I think Dennis had, the other candidates were very qualified. You know, Janet had been on a board of education in New Jersey. David had been with the Brimmer and uh, I think May. Brimmer, Brimmer and May mm -hmm. um, board. And, but Dennis, uh, I think has been involved a little bit with the school committee with the superintendent search. And he also is familiar with our school system with kids at Pine Hill. So I think, I think that's a strong recommendation from the school committee, just my personal opinion. All right, to, to bring it back here for a second, um, are there any questions for, um, are the individual people here? Are the uh, candidates? I see the Janet's team? on here. Um, I don't know. I don't see the other. I just wanted to give an opportunity if the select board wanted to ask any questions. I think they should be allowed to speak all, all three if they wanted to. I think only one is here actually, because they, they had their interviews with the school committee on their last Thursday. So I think that was. Yeah. Oh, are, there, are there any specific questions from anyone here on the board, I guess for the one attendee? Yeah. No, I don't, I'll just speak. I had just thought, um, I, I happened to see the um, the opening and being, I've been here about seven years, but not, I didn't have my, my children were raised in the system here. So I didn't have a kind of a, a ticket into town. And I just thought with my background, it was a nice way for me to step in to be of service because I knew what being a board member um, on a school committee was all about. And um, it's no easy job um, by any means. So I just thought it would be, had been an easy entree and easy for the board for me to assimilate or the committee, I mean. That said, I think Dennis is a wonderful addition to the committee, so. But thank you for the opportunity. And that being said, we are lucky that Janet's here. She's usually in further reaches um, in non-COVID time. So yeah. I was just very thankful that um, she would step in and, and apply for this because she does have a wealth of knowledge on many fronts. And, and one thing I did say to the interviewees on, at the school board meeting on Thursday is even if you're not appointed to this position tonight, Janet, since you're here directly to you, there are a lot of openings around town. We'd love to, you have an impressive background. We'd love to see you involved in town and, and we're, we applaud you for putting your name in the hat. Thank you. Okay, and well, I thank you also. Thanks. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, too often over the years, I've been either on this board or, 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 or just involved with the town. Too often you see one applicant, one position. And I think this gives me a lot of optimism that we actually see, um, you know, several people wanting to be involved with uh, the high paying job of volunteer town government. <laughs> so true. So, so if there's other, no other questions for the select board, can I make a nomination to appoint Dennis Quaint to the open uh, seat on the Sherburn School Committee? I just want a, a quick point of um, this order, a quick point of saying, so, is this right now a co-meeting with the um, school committee or they already voted, right? So does the school committee either have to call- no, they, vote, they vote with us. Yeah. I think all so of us vote together as one vote. Right. 
So I guess, um, I guess, I guess, Angie might go to you. I think uh, you're, at least the school committee might have to call to order to acknowledge it's a public meeting right now. If there, are, if you have a quorum of the school committee in that, and I do, and, I then do. I'll go around. I'll get the vote of um, the select board. I'll turn it over to you, and you get the vote of the school committee. Okay. okay. And then we'll we'll follow up on George's uh, motion. Okay. So Angie, do you want to open your meeting? I do. So I'm calling to to order the meeting of February 18th as a joint meeting with the select board and the Sherburn School Committee. It is being recorded um, in coordination with the COVID-19 um, exception by Charlie Baker. And we have a quorum of our members here. All right, so very good. So right now I have a, a motion by George um, to nominate uh, Dennis. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, so I'll take a vote of the select board members. Uh, Jeff, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, George? Aye. Uh, Paul? Aye. And I am I as well. I'll turn it over to you, Angie. Okay. And we have a motion by a select board member, George Morrill, to appoint Dennis Punt to the uh, school committee vacancy. Do I hear a, a motion to approve that? So moved, Amanda Brown. Do I have a second? Megan Page, second. Thank you. I'm gonna pull for a vote. Megan? Megan Page, yes. Amanda? Amanda Brown, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. All right, very good. Thank you. I don't know if you have to vote to close the meeting or not. I know it gets kind of uh, very uh, logistic, but <laughs> I'll go ahead and vote. So do I have a motion to close the Sherburn School Committee meeting for this portion? So moved. Thank so you. moved. <laughs> and second by Megan. Thank you. Yes. All in favor, we'll just all do an aye. And aye. We are good. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Janet, for uh, volunteering. All right, so moving on, um, still on the same agenda item, consideration appointment of the Sherbin Arts Council. Uh, we have uh, one candidate here, Jennifer Lynn Devin, for a term to expire February 18th, 2024. So moved. Second. All right, moving seconded. Uh, all in favor, Jeff? Aye. Uh, George? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well, very good. All right, moving right along. We have a briefing and update on the community choice aggregation process and what our next steps are. I believe this is from the uh, energy committee. Uh, who's speaking on this? Is it Fred or who is? Uh, Greg. Who's I am. Uh, I am Eric Greg Kennan, 129, Hol 129 Hollis Street. Hi, Greg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a member of the energy advisory committee and I see a number of my colleagues are on uh, the screen as well, Andy Lauterbach. I don't see Fred, but I'm assuming he's on uh, Tom Trainer, Dorothea, and uh, I'm not sure Michael is on. He had, might have a conflict with the Conservation Commission, but a number of us are here. And what our purpose is, is to brief you on the next steps in the community choice aggregation process, its timeline, and what you're likely to see in the next month or so. A working group of the Energy Committee has been hard at work with the town's aggregation consultant, Mass Power Choice, or MPC, to develop an aggregation plan. While we're still at work refining the plans, we're getting pretty close. So time is ripe for, um, for this briefing and, and uh, some exciting developments that will be coming up pretty soon. You should have in your materials, I believe, uh, drafts of the aggregation plan and the education and outreach plan. There's a third document called the energy supply agreement, um, which is a long, complicated and pretty standardized contract type of document uh, that doesn't really vary from instance to instance or from town to town. So uh, Diane and I made the executive decision not to put it in your materials to save you time and trees. Uh, but please note that these documents are drafts. They continue to undergo revision. They're close to final, but they're not necessarily the final documents. And furthermore, these plans were developed by MPC, the consultant, based on their experience with getting numerous aggregation plans approved by the Department of Public Utilities, the DPU. Uh, MPC advises us that these documents are what the DPU expects to see in these plans, they become fairly standardized through multiple approval cycles uh, by other towns uh, before the DPU. And that standardization makes review and approval by the DPU easier and quicker. Departing from the precedent 
will make the review and approval process longer and more difficult. So while I say the plans continue to undergo revision, that's within limits and we don't want to stray too far from the precedent and introduce complications into the regulatory process. Um, I should note also that the nitty gritty details of uh, what the specific prices of electricity to be offered to the town uh, will be, uh, what the percentage of renewables, the term of the, of the contract and that kind of thing uh, are not determined now. The plans are designed to maintain flexibility. Those kinds of details will be settled uh, at the time we actually go out to bid for an electric supply uh, to be uh, provided to the town's citizens. Uh, and they depend on what the market conditions will, are like uh, at that time. That can be months from now. It could be nine months or a year from now by the time we actually get through the DPU approval process so the plans here are somewhat general, but those kinds of specific details won't be determined for quite some time. So uh, what are the next steps in the process? Well, basically we announce the plans and conduct a public comment period. The law requires that these plans be put out for public review and comment by the citizens of the town. So we'll be holding a public presentation and a public comment period. We'll post the plans, to the town website, um, the sustainability website, if it's available by then, uh, and announce it over uh, uh, communication channels from the town on the e-alert system, in the local newspapers, over next door, and so other social media, and uh, on the sustainability website, if it's available by then. Uh, we'll uh, post those three plans for uh, public comment. Citizens can review them and submit comments. And we'll also conduct a public meeting over Zoom at which we'll describe the plans and answer questions and take comment at that time, if there are any, uh, as part of the public comment process. Comments can also be submitted either by physical mail or by email. And uh, we have a special email box set up for that purpose, uh, powerchoice at sherbornema.org, our very own mailbox. Uh, once, the, once the comments are, uh, the comment period closes and we'll assemble all these comments and put them together along with other documents in a very large filing that will be submitted to the DPU to get our aggregation plan approved. Uh, we'll need the select board's approval to file that at the appropriate time. So we'll be back before you at some point, but that's not going to be for a month or six weeks from now. And we go after that, we go through the DPU approval process. As I said, that can take months. It could be six or nine months or maybe even a year. Once we get that approval, we will um, uh, then go out to implement the plan. And once again, you'll see us again at that point. Um, so in the short term, the timeline is as follows, and it's still a little under development, but we'll make a public announcement in the next couple of weeks. We were shooting for this coming Monday, but I don't think we're going to make that, so we'll probably push that back a week or so. Call it March 1st. Public presentation will be roughly a week later. March 8th looks like a pretty clear uh, date on the town calendar. So that's when we're tentatively planning to have that. And again, at that, we'll present the plans and take questions and, and uh, comments from the public, if any. And the close of the public comment period will be three weeks after the plans are announced. That's become pretty much the standard in this field. So call that March 22nd. And then again, we have to assemble this filing after that and uh, we'll be back before you to get the formal approval of the board to file the plans with the DPU. Um, uh, that's pretty much the timeline. I do want to say I want to thank Diane and Jeannie and Jackie, all of whom have been very helpful. Um, Sue Kelleher also, I'm going to speak with her tomorrow about helping to publicize this. They've all been very helpful with the logistical issues uh, around the announcement of the plans and the public comment period. We're grateful to them. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, I want the select board to be aware that this is an entirely volunteer effort, or 99% anyway. Fred, Andy, and Michael in particular have devoted considerable time and effort to making this a reality. 
They are great colleagues and they epitomize the volunteer spirit and devotion to the good of the community that makes Sherborne such a good place. Thanks. That's Thank what I have much. to say. I'm uh, happy to take questions or proceed as, as you would like. Well, thank you very much, Greg. And I, I think uh, as I do, and I'm sure the select board also does appreciate the effort. You know, you heard me probably joke at the last agenda item about you know the high paying uh, position of volunteer town government. But it's amazing in this community how much it's not just governed, but also volunteers actually do the work, have boots on the ground, and actually do um, so much of the effort in this community. So we do appreciate that. Um, are there any questions from the select? Oh, Paul, uh, yeah. please go ahead. Yes, uh, this energy aggregation program has a lot of good benefits to the town. The environmental benefits that we can choose better renewable sources of energy, the possibility of saving money and so on. And so in the presentation, I didn't hear those points being emphasized and I wanted to first mention them and secondly to ask the the uh, Greg or the any member of the committee to kind of tell the community why we're doing this what the benefits are and and how it's going to make life better for our community are you saying you'd like that now Paul yes well, Sure, sure. Well, a lot of those a lot of those were discussed at the town meeting uh, at which the aggregation or, or the authority to proceed with the aggregation plan were um, uh, was uh, approved. Um, but basically what the advantages to the community are is right now uh, citizens in town are uh, pretty much confined to one source of electric power um, uh, that is ever source unless they specifically go out and, and negotiate an individual contract on a house by house basis with an alternative energy supplier. What aggregation does is that it allows the town to enter into a contract with an alternative energy supplier that can vary the sources of energy that are brought to the citizens of the town, to their homes and to the town buildings and facilities. So for example, right now, Eversource uh, provides a uh, certain percentage of renewables, uh, renewable energy in their sources. It's 18%, it varies according to law, but it's 18%. We could, as a town, enter into a contract that allows uh, citizens to provide, to obtain 100% renewable from wind or solar, or some intermediate percentage of uh, renewables at a different price. So the uh, use of the, of the term community choice aggregation is very apt because we'll have choices. Uh, and, and normally the way these work is that citizens are able to choose from among several different options at different price points and different degrees of renewable energy as they see fit. But it allows the town to aggregate its purchasing power to uh, bring those kinds of choices to the citizens of the town. And isn't it true that people can opt out? Yes, absolutely true. People don't have to participate. They can opt out uh, and stay with Eversource, or they can stay with their individually negotiated alternative energy provider if they'd like, uh, and uh, they can opt back into the program later if they want to. So it really does provide a kind of choice that is lacking today. And I should say that um, this is not this program will not be unique to Sherborne of the 351 municipalities in the Commonwealth something like 140 have these programs. So it's, it's uh, we're joining a, a, an august group of towns who have seen the light and have implemented these kinds of programs. And one of the things that your group is going to do or working with the consultant is going to do is this public outreach and public education of which you've just done some. Sorry to in, impose on you that way, but there are a lot of people in the community who don't really understand. And I remember after the last time we had that vote, people were asking me, what does that all mean? So thank you for that explanation, but there will be more explanations. Isn't that correct? Yes, absolutely. Well, that, that's part of what the public presentation that we're hoping to have on, on or about March 8th will do, 
it'll explain this, it'll explain what it's all about, and it'll also explain the process and give the citizens of the town an idea of what the benefits of uh, the features and benefits of a municipal aggregation program are. So do you have a, a place, time, a Zoom number, anything, any details? Uh, no, not yet, not yet. We're working on that, but it will be announced widely. As I said, we're, we're hoping to have it on March 8th and we're hoping that the announcements will go out next week. Oh, I have one question. Yes. Um, how do you choose you know, which um, supplier to pick, be it a 100% renewal, 50% renewal? Is it based on, do you do analysis of like renewable versus cost or some, do you have some metric that you um, almost you know, go to bid with or have a selection process? How was that process, uh, selection made? Yeah, it, bids are solicited. The consultant uh, will go out and solicit bids from alternative energy suppliers, and, and they could be um, something that looks like Eversource's mix of renewables, or they could be from uh, local renewable sources. They're called New England Class 1 renewable sources. Texas Wind um, is another source. The, some of the wind farms out west provide uh, renewable energy. And uh, there are suppliers out there who are willing to sell them. That's the job of the aggregation consultant to kind of broker those uh, arrangements, to solicit bids and then working with the committee and, and with the select board who will ultimately have to sign the contract for this, um, that, will, uh, that will be determined. But again, the market is very dynamic and we won't know the specific prices or optimum mixes of renew renewables versus price until we actually go out to bid. And as I said, that's gonna be months, if not a year from now. Yeah, and, and I think you, you basically have answered my next question. The Energy Committee meets and makes a recommendation and the select board actually does the contract, correct? Yes, correct. All right. Any other questions from the select board before I take the general public? All right, uh, any questions from the general public? Yeah. Yeah, Andy. Um, yeah. Uh, my name is Andy Lauderback, 36 Brush Hill Road. Um, I just wanted to add, I'm a member of the Energy Committee along with Greg and Fred. Um, and I wanted to just add a couple of remarks. First of all, the aggregation program only relates to the generation of energy, not the transmission. So you will still get your bill from Eversource and pay Eversource and Eversource will maintain all the power lines, and if there's uh, you know, power lines down, it'll be Eversource who takes care of it. So it's really just the generation. Um, and the other thing that uh, aggregation does is it provides more price stability because the contract is for a longer period of time, whereas Eversource's charges uh, will fluctuate during the course of a year, uh, depending upon demand and supply, this contract would be set for the, the term of that contract. Now, we can't guarantee that prices will be lower. Uh, it's it's uh, hoped that uh, some of the options in the plan would make uh, result in lower prices, but that can't be guaranteed, and especially not at this point. Understood. Understood. All right, any other questions from the general public? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Greg. And we look forward to the next steps on this. Absolutely. Um, thank I'm you. I'm personally excited about this. Okay. Um, all right, nothing, uh, nothing else. I'll move on to what looks like the bulk of our agenda. Agenda item number five, consideration of FY22 only budget warrant articles. We have uh, building department, select board, finance, recycling, and veterans. We'll do them in the order as presented right then and there. I guess, is Shannon taking the lead on this? Sharon, Sharon, I'm sorry, Sharon taking the lead on this. Chris Canny is on, I know. I got to find him though. Where He's waving his there? hand. There he is, I see him. <laughs> He's hiding, told you. All right, everyone on the board has their background materials. Um, you know, like um, as usual to move this through, if people just give like, you know, a brief statement about the about their budget overview and particularly highlight those things that are basically significantly different from the previous year. And that's usually the focus of a lot of our questions and so on like that, just to keep this streamlined. Um, so I guess, uh, Chris, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so my budget this year is relatively boring. 
uh, it's pretty much flat across except for the addition of a um, annual service contract fee that we have entered into uh, for our online permitting software. If, if you don't remember, uh, we received the Community Compact IT grant uh, last year to, to fund the initial purchase and, and setup of the um, online permitting software through People GIS. Um, going forward, there is a maintenance cost for them to uh, host all of our data on a bunch of cloud servers and, uh, and also uh, maintain the functionality of the software. So um, essentially this, this will be a recurring fee. It's $10,500 uh, a year to maintain the software and, and, uh, and all the um, uh, storage and things that goes along with it. And that's kind of, the, that's, the, that's about the big thing to, to worry about. Other than that, uh, you know, last year was a pretty good year for the building department as far as fees go. We brought in just under $200,000. So well over what it costs to run the department, uh, even with the $10,000. Uh, addition. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer a quick them. One. Just a quick one, just because um, just what I see in the, lo in the local community that I work at. Um, with COVID, it's a lot of people been doing home repairs. Has there actually been an increase in fees this last year compared to previous years, or how's the trend been? Um, so there was a, a period where things kind of dropped off a little bit, and, and we were seeing most of the work happening on some of the newer projects, like the fields uh, continued going through all of this stuff. But there has been quite an uptick in sort of smaller renovations, kitchens, bathrooms, basements, uh, a lot of swimming pools going in this year uh, that we hadn't seen for a while. So um, there is a trend towards um, more, uh, you know, renovation type permits um, as people are home. I think we had um, 317 building permits issued last calendar year, which is just over what, what was issued the year before. Um, so yeah, I, I would say we've, we've been pretty steady all the way through this thing. Um, the, the good news is that the permitting software really enabled us to keep working um, and, and taking all this, this, uh, these permits in electronically when, when the town hall has been closed. So it's been a huge asset uh, to be able to, to direct people to you know, file the permit online, pay online, uh, interact with them and all the other departments electronically uh, has been a huge uh, boon for, the, for the, all of us that have to work with these uh, permits all the time. That is that's impressive. If I do some quick head math, that's like 15% of the housing stock of the town has had some kind of building improvement. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, George, you had a question? He just answered it. I wanted to ask oh. him how the new software was working out and he just pretty much answered my question. So. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, any other questions from the board? How about any questions from uh, the general public? All right. Thank you very much, Chris. It's always straightforward when your budget's the same. Thank you. <laughs> or less. Have a good night. We should actually let people get away with no questions if they reduce their budget. That should be the new incentive. <laughs> um, so select board and select board legal. It says here David Williams. Will Diane or Sharon talk about this at all? Um, I can touch base um, a little bit with you, George, on that. We pretty much flatlined the selectman's budget as much as we could. Um, we are asking the select board to support moving the technology line item into the omnibus budget in a department all of its own because that was a big discussion that was had last year with the advisory committee. So we are looking for the support from the selectman on that. And um, the sustainability coordinator is now under the selectman's budget. And David worked closely with Dorothea, who's here tonight, and um, Gino, who I think is coming on. So if they have any questions that they'd like to ask Dorothea, they can. I have a question just on that point. All right, Paul. I noticed that for the sustainability coordinator, it's like zero, 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 and then we have a, uh, big increase and that big increase is because the funding that we had for it I gather is expired and so we have to go to our tax dollars to, to continue the funding. Is that That's correct. The explanation. Thank That's you. Correct. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Anyone else on the board? Yeah, uh, George. So the technology line item that's on here now, Diane, are you proposing or maybe this is a question for Sharon? Um, are you proposing moving that out of the select board budget into its own budget? Or yes, under instead its own of having it on here? Because it seems like last year we had no budget, but we it's just kind of up and down numbers there. So I and I know we've talked about that, Sharon, about having IT be its own department. So I guess this proposes it stays in the select board, but you're saying maybe we'll move it to another section. 
Yeah, David, um, David wants me to reach out to each and every department, uh, identify all the IT costs, and then pull them all together in one budget. So I've, mm. I've started that process. And hopefully for the next select board meeting, I can present that. Okay. So that would take that 35,000 out of the select board budget and move it into a, a, a separate IT budget. Correct. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there would be matching funds from other departments that would also be moved in there. Right, right. Yes, exactly. All right. Um, I guess any other questions from anyone? I'll look now in private. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moving on. My cat moves out of the way. Uh, Finance Town Accountant, here. I'll give Shannon a chance to cut to talk. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, um, and actually, um, I followed the guidance. Um, you can see that um, I, the expenses are, are pretty, um, pretty flat. Um, and actually, in total, um, I, I was able to bring them down by um, 6,930, so. Um, Good job. Then you get no questions. I know. I no was questions. just. I was going to say down. No questions. <laughs> you you missed. That. I was going to about to say. Okay, next agenda. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's great. Thank you. They don't have any softball questions. <laughs> All right. How about the general public? Well, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. It's great Thanks, to see. Sure. Um, uh, recycling. I think I see Charlie on the uh, on the call here. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, How are you doing, Charlie? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Yes, and that's, uh, by the way, I, on the, uh, it says Charles Tyler Warren. Warren is my middle name, so it got kind of <laughs> shifted. But I, I'm incognito as, as Charles War Tyler Warren tonight. Uh, our budget also is level funded. Um, we are managing by going to the, uh, the state grant funds that we have still some of recycling dividend program, which is one of the efforts that we do every year. Um, and we're remaining level funded for our committee activities. We have a really good act, uh, active committee, so we may be doing some more actions uh, than we have been. I'm looking forward to working with them, but uh, we're again, level funded and expect to be much the same as before. So I have two questions. Sure. Yeah, Paul. So we all know that recycling with this China business has been a bit of a disaster. I'm wondering how we're seeing in terms of what are we seeing in terms of recycling rates in the community is that not the doing well the actual rates of recycling have have remained okay one of the things that we've missed this year is our swap shop our our municipal solid waste went up by about 10 percent uh this past year uh partly due to the fact that all the furniture and stuff that people save for the swap shop is now just going into the trash because we can't uh, recycle it. We tell people, please take it to some other place, but even the other places weren't taking it either. Savers and places like that were denying people. So a lot of stuff has gone into the trash that normally we'd be able to keep out uh, and, and uh, either reuse or recycle in, in a lot of different ways. Um, some bright spots are that our, our, uh, our scrap metal also went up and scrap metal prices have risen. Uh, right now, the latest scrap metal uh, sheet that we got back, we received three times the price that we were getting last year at this point for our scrap metal. So um, small, small glimmers of, of hope in, in that sense. Um, in, and uh, yes. So I have my second question was that I know we have additional charges that, that we charge people for, for some large items, I think like mattresses and some electronics and things like that. Have that been, has that been looked at recently? Is that, does that need to be updated in any way? Are, are we where we should be on those items? Uh, yeah, we're, we're in pretty good shape on, on those particular items. Uh, some of the items, the electronics, uh, the, the, the costs on those are rising uh, slightly uh, uh, this year. But uh, right now we're, we're in pretty good shape for where we are. We're, we're almost breaking even, but uh, our opinion has always been you know, you, you, you really should give the taxpayer something for their tax money as well. So we're, we're, we're not losing a lot of money on those things that we're spending money on for recycling. The, the places where there are expenses are uh, paper and commingled, and that's mainly because of the, the recycling climate in, in the entire country. We expect that to improve as time goes on as well. But right now that's costing us more than 
than it has in the past. We used to get paid for both of those things. Uh, now we're, we're spending money to do that recycling, which we have to do because the state requires it. Uh, George, you had a question? Yeah. No, I'm just gonna, just to remind Paul, we adjusted the rates on all those last year with yeah, that's right. that, all those with the recycling committee last year, which is good. Um, so uh, the other thing I just wanted to add because the swap shop is closed, um, on Facebook, there's a group called the Buy Nothing Project for Dover and Sherburn. It's only for re it's for residents only, and it's a very active group of a lot of people. Um, I think in place of the swap shop, posting items that they don't need, and other people getting them and doing porch pickups or whatever. So it's kind of a nice community group. If you're on Facebook, that you should look into. It's called the Buy Nothing Project Dover Sherburn. Um, just just a plug as a way to reuse items instead of taking them to the dump. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And even even if we manage to get that, we our committee is really excited about trying to get the swap shop going again this spring. And I've been saying, oh, that's pretty optimistic. I don't know. We're going to have to come up with a plan, make sure that the uh, the, the COVID nineteen uh, group uh, agrees with with that plan if we do it, and so forth. But even if we get the swap shop going, uh, that kind of website uh, would be great competition for us. And if there's there's never enough place for that stuff to go. So. Thanks for that, George. And I don't, I don't want to beat this a whole long because there's a lot of logistics stuff. Yeah. But even as far as comes the cost, I, I you can I can absolutely see the solid waste going up. Uh, is there any kind of uh, metric that you think will cause to reopen the swap shop? I know it's done by volunteers, but you know when we're at so much capacity, or what, or is, does the COVID team chime in on that? Um, it, it is it is a useful um, it's a useful tool that we have. Does anyone? Yeah, it, um, it, 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 it was shut down because of the COVID nineteen. Yeah. And so for it to open back up, it would be a matter of satisfying the COVID-19 regulations. I, I, you know, there's plenty of enthusiasm on the committee. Uh, we have volunteers ready to, to step in and help out as well, but uh, we just, we can't do it because of the, the COVID-19. And in the past, we've had people from outside the community coming in to take things because if we didn't, we'd build up, build up, build up, and we'd have to throw a bunch of stuff away anyway because people in Sherburne don't take all the stuff that people from Sherburne like to drop off. So, um, but we would have to curtail that somehow, figure out a way to control crowds and figure out a way to, to make that work so that social distancing was allowed and, and so forth. So, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Right, um, any other questions from anyone? All right, you're not. Thanks Thank again, Charlie. Yeah, that's such a great service. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. And the final one is veterans. And I think I saw Doug Brody on here somewhere. Yep, I'm here. Another, yes, there we go. Yes, Doug. I think you remuted remuted yourself. No, 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 he's good. Okay. He's good. I'm with you. Can you hear me? Sally's yes. helping him. That's why. Yeah. My yes. name is Doug, not Sally. <laughs> <laughs> I saw her. I she's there. Please make note of that. <laughs> uh, the veterans, the veterans this year are were affected. Obviously, were affected by the COVID nineteen, and I had uh, gave to you some uh, notes on the vote on the various items in the budget. The general comments really are that uh, the uh, Memorial Day ceremony, which was managed by Mike Kickham is generally, is a, is a, is a parade, it's, but, but we didn't do that this year, obviously. But Mike put together a very good uh, program uh, on the DC TV, which worked out very well for us. Also, uh, the usual Veterans Day ceremony was canceled. Obviously, we couldn't have that meeting, but in conjunction with the COA, we put together our grab and go lunch and sent out invitations to the 130 veterans that live in town. And we had 60 lunches that were picked up and that went very well. We're very pleased with that. Uh, I just would say as the, as the officer, we're dealing with the Veterans Administration, uh, which is a, a huge a group of people to deal with. Questions of benefits, uh, uh, of eligibility and procedure are answered. And, if necessary, guidance is provided uh, to help qualifying veterans. We never know how many veterans are going to qualify at any particular time. And as you will see in the budget items, I, I connect, Harry, about $3,000 in there, 
which is just as a hedge against it because we can be hit with a pretty big amount of money if a veteran qualifies for a veteran for, for the, the uh, benefits, which happened to us about four years ago. Um, now, if you're interested, I'll be happy to go through the various, uh, if you have that in front of you, the uh, various items uh, in the budget just very quickly. Uh, the con my the seven hundred dollars, which is which comes to me, is is to, to pay just for various things that I have to get and do. I don't have an office at the at the town offices, and I work out of my home. Uh, meetings and seminars for mandatory meetings are not having in any this year, but hopefully they will be picking up next year. Everything has been done on Zoom with the veterans too, so uh, that's worked out pretty well. Care of the veterans' graves. We uh, every year we have to put in about uh, I guess it's 385, 386 odd flags in the various uh, uh, cemeteries around town, and uh, that's that's uh, have the, all new flags have to be purchased, and many of the uh, holders also have to be purchased. That's done every year. Uh, our expenses uh, this year. Again, uh, because the Veterans Day was not held uh, as it usually is, we were able to uh, the, work with the COA uh, to put together that lunch. So that was a that was a lot less expense on my account, and I think I'm going to have to make some kind of arrangement with the COA because I think they picked that all up because there's nothing in my budget showing for that, which is not correct. Um, as I say, the Memorial Day event, uh, that was level funded, but nothing was done about that. Supplies are the same, travel and lodging, nothing expected there. Veteran benefits, again, the $3,000. So essentially the budget is level funded. Uh, I don't see any instance of having to pay, uh, having to come to the town for more money. Hopefully this will be uh, more than enough uh, and we will not have to deal with the veterans benefits. That always is sort of in the background. I have worry about that, but I have no indication that that's coming before us this year. Very good, Doug. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, you have a question? Oh, just an idea. Uh, yeah. A number of the towns that I work for have this uh, arrangement with uh, uh, an outside uh, organization where they put on what they call a field of honor. And this is a, a field that's filled with flags that are like uh, uh, large, relatively large size flags that are a few feet apart. It is absolutely breathtaking to look at these uh, fields of honor to give recognition to, to uh, the fallen and to veterans. I think it might be worth taking a look at that and seeing if that's something that we might want to consider doing here in Sherburne. Okay, Paul, that's, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. I know I, I agree with you. I think that's a very impressive, the ones I have seen is very impressive thing. And, and I, I will look into that, certainly. Thank you. Paul, oh, is that something that's up year round? In other words, no. they put it, it's a, is it just for no, a period just Yes, just for just for like thirty days around Veterans Day. Yes. Okay. I did. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? And how about the general public? Any questions from the general public? All right. Very good. Thank you. No further ado, and thank you very Thanks, much. Brad. Absolutely. Thank you very much for doing this. Okay, then moving on, next case, that case of the general omnibus uh, warrant articles agenda item. Uh, number six, consideration of annual town meeting and election day. Um, Jackie Morris, I saw you here before. Yeah, Sarah. hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, yes, you can. Okay. All right, so at the last select board meeting, um, the select board uh, seemed to indicate that they wanted to hold the annual town meeting towards the end of May and the election in June. So I was hoping that you guys would consider voting the actual date because I have been in contact with the sound and video company that we used last year that I thought did a terrific job. And a lot of towns are moving their dates out and I don't wanna be caught short and find out that um, 
I'm going to have a hard time finding the tent and the chairs and all the video and everything else. So um, the 29th of, is Memorial Day weekend. So I just threw out the date of May 22nd on Saturday to see if you guys would be um, interested in voting for that for the annual town meeting. The sound and video company is available that day to do it at Butler Street. And then um, if you wanted to, you could vote uh, the annual town election. And I was suggesting either June 8th or June 15th, which is a Tuesday. And also because the state of emergency is still in effect, um, you could vote to reduce the quorum at this time. I would I right. need to notify the attorney general's office and let them know of the date changes and also the vote of the quorum whenever that's done. Uh, so, quick question. This, uh, I just want to ask a quick question. What did we reduce the quorum to last time? Was it 25? 20. 20. 20? Okay. Okay, Paul. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I have a town meeting already on uh, May 22nd. And where we have only four members of the Board of Selectmen to begin with, by putting it on that date, we will only have three selectmen. Who could attend? I would not be able to attend because I'm going to be officiating at another town meeting on the same day. So because we're kind of late on the curve, towns are picking dates and so that date is not available to me. I'm wondering if we could do it on the 23rd, which is the Sunday, doing Sunday afternoon, or uh, some other time, but not on the 22nd. 22nd is a Saturday. Uh, it's just not doable for me. All right, any uh, thoughts on the board? At least on, on Paul's uh, proposal there. I mean, it's just unfortunate because Saturdays work better for most people. And, and I hate that another town takes precedence over us. That's, but I mean, I do understand Paul's thought that we only have four members, so we all should be there. Um, Is there a way, Paul, that we could look at uh, the times of day and, and consider, I don't know what time of day your other meeting was, but you could participate remotely from that other town, perhaps, if we adjusted the time. Start I, don't time. Think I don't think you can an open town meeting. No, I think the the remote open. participation yeah. doesn't really work. Okay. And I don't think you can. I think I think there actually was a decision from the state that actually says you can't. You know? So, so well, could we adjust the time of day? Well, I'm very active at these town meetings. I serve as town council, and I'm unlike uh, what we're used to in Sherburne. I'm very active on uh, addressing issues, many questions. A lot of people, bigger towns. Uh, it's an it's an exhausting thing. It's like it's like asking Tom Brady to play two Super Bowls in one day. It's a pretty exhausting day to do one well, time. That, that's quite a comparison, Paul. I'm I'm pretty sure he'd win them both as well. I'm pretty sure he'd win them both. We made we made Dustin Pedroia play double headers though, you know. You're gonna keep for sports. <laughs> Unless he played both games against the Giants, that probably be a pretty good then. Um, Jackie, I want to go back to Jackie because I mean, yeah. if, if May 22nd is the only day that works logistically, I mean, I think we do have still have three select board members. So I want to talk to Jackie about logistically. I don't want to make it really hard on her. Um, I think that's the most important piece is what makes that because a lot of times to be quite honest, by the time we get to town meeting, we've already had the public hearings, we've already given our position on everything. I mean, we're kind of there. We a lot of times we don't say much at town meeting. But Jackie, I think I want to make sure logistically it makes the most sense for her and for Mary Wolf, the town moderator, that that those dates are what works best for them because they're the ones that are the most active at those meetings. Well, my, my question is, um, I don't want to downplay Paul's participation at all because he's an important part of the board, but are you, because of COVID, I'm assuming that um, Eric will be sitting up front 
like we did last time and the other select board members will be in the audience. Yeah, which brings up a question then. Is a quorum of the select board actually a necessary requirement to town meeting? Like let's say let's say let's say I break my leg the day before and won't watch it happen now. But let's let's say something happens. <laughs> yeah, that's not and, good. <laughs> you know, I, I I can't make it for some reason. Let's you know? say you won the lottery, okay? Yeah, there you go. On a positive <laughs> note, okay? I would still show up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, let's say so, let's say someone can't make it and the only two members are available. Does that somehow hurt or negate town meeting all, or is it just simply is what it is? It does not negate town meeting, mm -hmm. but the the reason why you want the board there is that. Well, in most towns, people have amendments, people have mm -hmm. questions, and sometimes there's actually a dispute where it might be a close vote. And A, you want every vote possible to carry the programs that we want to get done, but you also need people who are going to speak to persuade the voters. And so when you need, when you have a town meeting where you need to marshal your resources you you want the full board there you want five yeah of course yeah. so but it's more of a want than a need just just kind of confirm i i get the logistics of that there my second question is maybe jackie can remind me or whatever mm -hmm. um the 22nd was a good date because that was so many days after the caucus right and the caucus is the first well, uh, it's 38 days and so caucus is um i haven't re received the final date from um the caucus committee, but it, I know that they were targeting somewhere around the 10th or something of April. So um, I, I, I don't think I'd have to double check with them, but the May 22nd definitely fit in, but also because you guys had said that you wanted to have it towards the end of May. And unfortunately, because of Memorial Day, we're losing May 29th as an, uh, I am assuming that we're losing May 29th as an option that you guys are not gonna wanna have annual town meeting on Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, I would definitely not support the 29th, really for the general public. I can make it because well, I life, but the general public. That's I why, think, I, would actually, yeah. that's why yeah. I was targeting the 22nd. I mean, I would support the 15th or the 5th. Um, I'm, what about I'm, the 15th? Yeah, I was going to say, what about the 15th? Would that would that work or is that too tight of a time frame, Jackie? Um, I would have to find out when caucus is and then work the days back. Um, the 15th would probably work. Um, I'd also, I just, I need to also call the video guy and make sure that the caucus is about elections. It doesn't, it's not dependent upon town meeting. Oh, right, right. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so you're thinking, days from you're thinking of the public it hearing with yeah, caucus doesn't matter. Right. Caucus, okay. It's that's for the election The the June, the June dates are fine. Yeah. It's, it's the election. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. I can do May 15th. And I'm fine with any one of those days. The only one I oppose is the 29th, just for overall public participation. Yeah, no, that doesn't work. And I, I know it's not part of this discussion, or it is part of this discussion, but I also support a reduction of the um, quorum to 20 or 25 as well. I thought it worked last time. And I Whatever we did support. last time, yeah. Yes, I agree. Okay, so... Um, should, should we table the date, though, until Jackie has a chance to check with the audio guy? I think maybe we... we tentatively mark your calendar and especially you Paul because I know you're the one that more has more conflicts but um that the 15th would be our date pending Jackie confirming with audio okay that would be fine it, Mary Wolf is I know is on Mary does May 15th work for you May 15th works for me okay it, it with regard to the uh quorum whenever they decide to um do that you know you actually need to take a, the select board actually needs to take a vote. Yes. So just sort of agreeing among themselves is probably not. Yeah, no, they, no, I need an official vote because I yeah, actually okay. have to submit it to the attorney general's office. I have to submit a formal vote that I witnessed the vote um, mm -hmm. of you lowering the quorum to the attorney general's office. So you don't have to do that tonight if you don't want to. I was, I just wanted to try to tie up as much as possible, especially just with the date and the, the logistics for planning at Butler Street are quite large, getting the 10. And last time I was scrambling to try to get um, a 10. Jackie, you can't, you can't, the board cannot vote the quorum reduction tonight because the law requires that our intention to do so be 
announced at one meeting and that the public have a chance to react yeah. to it before we actually take oh, the vote. I forgot about that. You are correct, Paul. Thank you. So, but we could take a, I could make a motion to schedule the town meeting for May 15th. Well, I guess, uh, George, uh, I think that's a good idea, but I'm wondering if we should um, uh, uh, say that we make the motion that we uh, support May 15th, but if the uh, production company is not available that date, that we go ahead with the 22nd, because I'm worried about is if we don't commit to one of the two tonight, and she finds out they're not available the 15th, and we may lose the 22nd also next time we meet two weeks from uh -huh. now. Yeah, that's and a good, that's a good point. Jeff. Have, as I have some serious direction from you guys, knowing that yeah. one of those dates is going to stick, then you can make an official vote later if you want. But I need one. I need I need some serious direction because I've got to tie. I've got to tie these people up. Yeah. So George, I would just your motion's good, but maybe just say if yeah. if the 15th is not available, then we would go with the 22nd. Go with the 22nd. Yep. Well, can I suggest I, that's that just my proposal, but. I agree with you, Jeff. Can I suggest the alternate date be June 5 rather than May 29th? In other words, uh, rather than uh, May 22nd, because that's the next available Saturday after uh, the 22nd. Does June 5 uh, push the election at all? Well, the election you guys had wanted, you know, I was recommending like June 8th or June 15th for the election. So it probably, it'll probably push that a little I, bit. I need to, I, you know, I know I'm not under time crunch right now, but it's like, I need to notify the residents that all these dates, I need to do a mailing. I just, I just wanted to make sure that all of this didn't get away from all of us. Um, I just feel better knowing what, what the dates are. I mean, we're not June, under time crunch right June now. June 5th could be high school graduation. You know, usually it's a Thursday night, but usually there's a lot of activities I know with COVID right. that may be different, but usually that first weekend in June is. You're pushing into June. You're pushing into a lot of other conflicts. I think I, I agree with Jeff. I think it's May 15th. If that doesn't work, then it's gotta be May 22nd. And then, and then fortunately Paul can't make it. I mean, that's why we have a five member select board and three is still a lot, so. Yep, still quorum. If that's a backup, that's not the end of the world. If I, I kind of agree with that, then. Uh, 15th with maybe 20 seconds of backup and if that happens then and I think it's unlikely to happen but okay all right so you, um, I will try to get on the next select board meeting and then you guys I can let you guys know what it is what the dates are and then you can do the official vote so why don't we do a vote tonight for that for those dates so we have it yeah I, I had a motion for the 15th with a backup of the 22nd do I have a second I would second that all right. So, um, all in favor, Jeff? Aye. Uh, George? Aye. Uh, Paul? Abstain. Okay. Okay, understood. And um, clean up, I'll be aye as well in that there. Uh, now, I just want a clarification then. Um, you'll, you'll need to, I'm sorry to interrupt. You'll need to determine the time and everything too once we. Okay, part of this vote right now, you need that? Do you want that right now, or is that when you come back? When I come back, you don't have to do it right now. And when you come back, you we'll appropriately to. post and do what we got to do to reduce the quorum. Because it sounds like we have a we have a. Um, the time could be the important to the company. So I mean, what worked last year oh. seemed to work well because we were trying to avoid the heat of the day. Also, nine a.m. And immediately it was August, not May, but mm -hmm. that seemed to be a good time. Um, I'm fine either way. I mean, you probably look at it. Probably, you probably might want the heat of a day, to be honest with you, in May. Yeah, I mean, they need to set up on Friday, so it doesn't really matter. It, ta it takes them a really long time to set up. So um, okay. they, would, they would set up on Friday and then disassemble everything on Saturday. So I do have another question might come down. Maybe it's to Mary, maybe it's to you, Jackie. When we when we vote to reduce the quorum, are there other numbers we, we should reduce? Like I remember at the last town meeting, you know, I, I I forgot how many actually showed up what the number was, but I noticed like for example, the vote to take an anonymous ballot vote 
was still required a count of 50 people. Like that wasn't reduced. And to have a quorum of 20, but a requirement of 50. And I don't know if there's other numbers like that as well, which should be reconsidered in the overall logistics or process of town meeting. I guess do either you, Mary, or Jackie know of any of those such numbers like that? I don't know. Um, as far as the the fifty for a standing uh, for you know a secret ballot, um, that's in the bylaws of the town. So I'm not sure what the you yeah. know the impact would be if you did try to change that. I'm sure the fifty though is based on a minimum quorum of a hundred, but obviously you can know. see the you know, kind of the conflict of a count of fifty you know not changing with a um, quorum of 20. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I just, I don't know what the mechanics are of enabling that or whether you want to or have to, I don't know. So I could answer that if you wanted. Yeah, please. Yeah, absolutely. So just as a matter of law, the authority to reduce the quorum is only to reduce the quorum. There is no authority to reduce any other number. Mm -hmm. So if you want to change that number, we can put a warrant article on the warrant for the future that would say that these other numbers are a percent of the quorum, whatever the quorum is. But there is nothing in any of the statutes that have authorized the reduction in quorum that allows you to reduce any other number. Yeah. I mean, I think it makes sense, but maybe I don't know if it's uh, other people want to put the effort in either way. I would also point out that we had pretty good attendance at our town meeting. And in yeah. fact, we didn't have to rely on the reduced quorum. That's right. it, was, it was a pretty good group there. So I think we met the quorum requirements anyway. And if people, if, if there was a need for a secret ballot, there was more than 50 people who could have stood up. No, and it did do it. It did do it. And particularly if we get the electronics to work this time. But we'll see what the quorum is if it's 45 degrees on the 15th. Um, all right. I, that's all I had. Any other questions on this uh, on this item? Well, I do. What about the election? The election date? Are you guys? Hmm. You want to wait? I so think the June eighth will meeting. work with either of those, right? Sorry. June eighth would work with either of those. Yeah. May fifteenth or May twenty second. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to set the election date for June eighth. Okay. Uh, do we need a backup date for that as well, like we did with the other one? No, because I'm I'm it's I'm in total control of that, and it's going to be at town hall. And then um, I don't know if I if I'm going to be able to do all the mailings and stuff. They've only um, extended all of the COVID election stuff through March 31st. So, uh, but but otherwise, everybody will be voting in person. The only thing I'll say, just for I guess point of discussion, is do you want to consider the 15th, just in case something has to shift again in town in the town meeting, since that's not set. And give us flexibility versus changing it. So the moderator has authority to extend town meeting at 30 days at a time. So if something comes up on the 15th or the 22nd and the moderator needs to extend that time, she can extend it by 30 days, which would be after June 8th. That's why I was considering June 15th is give flexibility, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think that's a that's a better move. Uh, George, you made the motion on the eight, on the eighth. Are you okay with uh, it being the fifteenth? Yeah. Uh, this allow that flexibility. Okay, just to, to clarify, motion is for June fifteenth. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Okay. So all in favor, Jeff. Aye. Uh, George. Aye. And Paul. Aye. I am I as well. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, going through the agenda here. Next one is a review of the warrant checklist for this next for the town meeting we just discussed, the 2021 annual town meeting. I guess uh, everyone has that in front of the background materials. Um, I don't know how much we can go into details and talk about an individual um, article, but at least, you know, looks like it's filling in nicely. You know, that. Uh, are there any comments on the current checklist? Do we want to run through? Uh, usually we run through through okay. it on an individual. Oh, that's not I, I got to get mine. 
Uh, who would do that? Would that be uh, just us as a chair? Would Mary go through it or Diane? I would just run through. No, it would be you, yeah. Eric. I would All just right. run through article by article. And we a lot of them will probably just be like, yeah, that's fine. Like, I just think we want to um, make sure that we're things are include are should be included that are on here. Just I think a quick run through doesn't hurt. All right, will do. Good idea. Okay, so uh, right now, as it's shown on the article number one is presented by the town administrator and it's just general reports. Article number two is uh, by a, a finance director and it's the FY21 supplemental appropriations for the current fiscal year. And right now they're showing uh, farm pond 25,000 current year, 75 for FY22. Um, well, I say, uh, article number three by the treasurer, it's a OPED trust fund. Um, article number four, it's also by the treasurer. It's a bond premium and authorization rescission. Article five, it's the cemetery and it's a en um, enlargement funds for cemetery. Article six by the finance administrator, um, unpaid bills prior fiscal years, dollars to be determined. Article Do seven. Have any? What's that? Question. Do we have any? I'd have to ask Sharon. Sharon. Um, as of right now, we do not have any. We've got time. Okay. Right. I do for the um, but going back up to the supplementals, we do have. We're definitely going to have police overtime again because right now we only have eight thousand left in our budget, and of course, snow and ice. At this point, we've we've already exceeded it by sixty-five thousand. So no, those all change typically right up until town meeting, right? They definitely right. will. But yeah, we're definitely going to have those though. I just wanted to make you aware. All right. Um, article seven, um, also by the uh, uh, finance director, uh, revolving funds. Are article there any, oh. are, are there any new revolving funds being sought this year? Are not. No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, article eight. Also, finance director, um, reserves, general um, general stabilization fund, uh, special ed stabilization, um, SEHC stabilization, OPED liability trust fund, and elder housing, fifty k for elder housing. Um, Article nine, also actually, finance director. El elder housing last night decided not to contribute again. That's right, because it was a roof. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Um, Article nine. Uh, finance director, creation of a facilities replacement reserve fund. So is that is that going to be a revolving fund? We said no revolving funds. What's the facility? Reserve, well, it's a reserve okay. fund. Reserve fund. Oh, that's right there, reserve okay. Mr. Chair. Sean's on. He could talk to that maybe. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. I'll talk briefly. This is, we're, we're in the process of still trying to figure out exactly what structure this will be. Um, it's, it's not totally common. Um, but there, there is different ways that some municipalities are handling their, their, um, their town meeting. Um, basically, the the capital ask for the facilities. Um, the way we're doing it now, we're just we're doing a different uh, article every year, and it and it gets a little bit messy to clean up at the end because you have three or four of them possibly open at the same time. Um, so this will help to streamline that, and obviously in. Obviously, the the very next one is to fund it. Um, the hope is we're going to be happy with the um, with what we come up with with for wording to create it, and then we need obviously need to fund it this year. Okay. How much are you looking for? That's still up in the air. I, I'm working back and forth with advisory um, it, because it 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 plays into how much is in the operating budget for the facilities. Typically, we, we have much less in the in the operating budget and more in the town meeting warrants, but there's been a trend to, to push that the other way a little bit. All right. Um, yep, so that, as Sean indicated, Article 10 is funding a facilities replacement reserve fund, which is discussed. Article 11 is advisory and finance director for the FY22 omnibus budget, omnibus budget, of which I will read off the specific line items for the capital improvements. 
Um, what I'll do actually, I'm gonna read, read them by groups. So if you have a question, um, wait until I'll, I'll do, read both fire departments, the police, all the DPWs and so on like that. This is the capital projects, Eric? Yeah. That you read? So that's actually article 12. The omnibus budget is 11, that's the operating budget. Oh, okay, okay, right. You're right, you're right, I'm sorry, we're about that. Um, so any questions about the omnibus budget before I move on to capital? Okay, on capital, we have uh, 1A and 1B from the fire department. We have a command vehicle for 45.5K and a hose replacement for 37K. All right. um, uh, we have 3A, the police. Um, cruisers, a uh, total of 99K, fully marked 55K and unmarked 44K. How many cruisers? Two. And apparently the markings cost $11,000. Okay, thank you. Um, we have several for DPW. We have uh, equipment, non-road work, equipment, road work, a one-ton truck, uh, the roadway management appropriation, and the, uh, the Pine Hill Access Road and campus improvements. Any questions on those? Well, on the Pine Hill Road, don't we have an earmark from the Commonwealth on that? Not, not I mean, an earmark is not actual funding. I mean, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it comes through. And sometimes earmarks actually require an appropriation. Yeah. I believe this one didn't, uh, is my recollection. And so if, is, is the earmark not enough and we have to supplement it? Not necessarily. Oh. I think it's like a, a, it's an earmark. It's not a, the state has voted to fund our road. So, no, but I know what it is. I, I know. So that, that that's a big difference. Was Sean saying something? I was trying. We wanna, to. If we want to make sure we have funding for the road, I mean, we got to, we can hope we get the earmark. That earmark hasn't been funded yet. It's, right. um, it was signed off. I think it's in a bond bill. Uh, yes. Even if that bond bill gets passed, it still needs to go back and get funded. So the, the, the thought was hopefully between now, we just bought ourselves an extra month for town meeting. Um, you know, I, what would be the worst case? We bring this to town meeting and then we drop it because we uh, we got the funding. We have a few more months to find the funding uh, if that earmark or a different grant came through. Um, but this is a pretty time sensitive issue at, at the moment. If anyone drives through town, um, or tries to pick their children up at Pine Hill. It's it's an untenable situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I while I got my mic unmuted, you, you want to go to the next one because that's the that's the one I, I did want to talk about. What Haven? At least uh, before I do, there's this one general thing I want to say because you brought up the bond, um, uh, the transportation bond bill, and Mike on the roadway management. Uh, currently under the bond bill has, has been approved, whether it's funded or not, and I think it may be funded actually, there's $100 million in there for municipal assistance. And what that is actually it's for the state to provide local communities to resurface and improve roads that are, st are state numbered roads, but owned by the community. And for a small town like Sherbin, we have a couple of them. I think one was resurfaced a couple of years ago, but I wanna keep that in mind before at least we do any improvements or allocate any roadway management um, to the other road in town. So something to think about because I think we would, we would um, position ourselves very well for those for those grant funds. But yeah, go on, Sean. The next one is um for the uh, Woodhaven Leland Farms public water supply improvements. And, and I don't want to make a full presentation, but I want to keep bringing this one up because this is an important article. Um, because we've, as you'll remember, this board voted to A, do the study to um, the feasibility and then we, we proceeded with DEP because we're in a position where we have to move forward with permitting um, and, and that work is in process. So it's, um, it, it, it's basically gonna need to be done. These are two at-risk communities that um, this is a system that's gonna, that, that needs to be done. DEP is gonna basically require it and uh, people other than me probably should have some conversations about how that gets paid back and the structure of that financing, but um, the work needs to get done and it, and it really needs to get done within probably a calendar year. So this fiscal. All right. Yeah, um, okay. I may have some uh, follow-up questions on that. I'll probably just go, I'll reach out to you. Actually, before I finish, I was finished, but I do want to mention that there's probably a fairly good chance we may be able to get some grants, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even direct from DEP uh, to help with that construction. 
Oh, very good. Huge sense. So any questions on that? Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to go back here a second. I mentioned to some of you this week, um, there, there was an article in the Capitol for COA previously. It looks like it's been removed. Oh, it's, it's there. It's the next one. So, yeah. so um, when we get to that, there, there were two articles <laughs> for the COA, and I think they're probably going to reduce it to one of the two. They haven't voted yet. But I just wonder, should we wait? They're meeting next week and then decide how to handle their articles next week. I don't think we're voting on any of these tonight. I think this is just more of a run through. So we're kind of okay. getting a direction on where to go. Maybe we actually vote on the, what's included in the warrant next week. Yeah, we discussed this COA one quite a bit. I think it was last week. Yeah. yeah. So I that's why I reached out to them. So they, I think that they're going to sort of have one article and combine the two. There's one further down used to be in my version it was article 20 um they're probably going to combine the two and reword them a little bit okay. so I, we've worked out a game plan so that they have an idea of what they think is going to work and jane was on the call with us all jane matarazzo um, who's the advisory representative to coa and um we both had trisha and chris winterfeld on the call and Sue Keller, Sue Kelleher. Sorry, Sue. So since we're on that, it seems we kind of moved on to that that item. Are there any other questions about this uh, architectural study? I, we did discuss it quite a bit previously. Well, no, I that, do have, oh, go ahead, Paul. I think that's the article that they want to preserve, and it was going to be broadened to to include uh, sort of a survey. So there's there's going to be some changes in language. So I think we should defer on this until. We have their thinking. Okay. Yeah, it's going to involve a lot of um, town thinking in terms of what can be done, also. Yeah. Okay. And that there. So I have a question on the next one, Article 13. Wait, wait, wait. Before you move on, okay. um, one of the articles that's later on should actually be included in Capital the recreation article about the turf fields at Laurel. That's not for just a feasibility study. They're hoping to have a full presentation for, mm -hmm. for turf fields at Laurel. And if they don't have it ready, they may pull it and wait till next year, but they don't need a feasibility study. They've already studied it. Um, they're hoping to actually have a capital item that they're presenting to the capital budget committee for a turf field at Laurel. So that should move up to the capital section. Diane, if you could just note that to, I don't think Jeannie's on here, but that that article should be included in capital. Then if it is, uh, is there any questions or discussion about that? Mm -hmm. Presumably it's moved up. Is this one turf field or multiple turf fields? Uh, they're, they're working on that. They're trying to determine um, their, their plan, just as a brief note, just because I've been involved with this, because I'm intimately involved with it based on my girls playing a lot of sports, um, that potentially two fields, they're looking at two versus one, but their main thing is how much money can they raise to private money so it's not just the town footing the bill and also they want to make sure that their revenue from these fields would cover any debt service for them so it would cost the taxpayers nothing that's their that's their goal here so and it would be something that's as a parent I can tell you grossly needed for kids in sports that and a great opportunity for the town to generate a lot of revenue. I mean, we're not competitive because there's only one turf field in all of Dover and Sherburne, and it's reserved for high school sports. So all the youth sports don't get to use turf for field hockey, lacrosse, soccer. So we're at a disadvantage to other towns. And how would they raise revenue? Uh, fundraising through the youth lacrosse, youth field hockey, youth soccer, those groups all are interested in, in raising private money from parents doing fundraisers to, to donate to, uh, to, um, to fund this as, as part of the funding. Well, I was concerned about the operating costs. I am worried that we try to rent the fields to like the New England Patriots and we have. I don't think the New England Patriots are gonna be practicing in Sherburne, but there are men's leagues in the area that would rent it. And I think that's where you generate a lot of revenue. You have youth sports, you have adult leagues, you have a lot of opportunity. Those fields, if you, I mean, I've seen, I've been on a lot of these fields in other towns in the last couple of years. They're full. They, one game ends, the next game starts from sunrise to sunset. So it's a lot of opportunity and you can use the fields a lot earlier in the season. 
and a lot later in the season in the fall because of due to weather and that kind of stuff. And they're a lot less maintenance because you don't have to mow them every week. Yeah, yeah. There's pro, pros and cons to it, though, George. I, yeah, I'm no, I know. I'm mixed sure on that too. Why, so I want recreation to be able to present it, but that's kind of where the thinking is. One yeah. thing we may want to get input: the Board of Health. There's certain designs that are better for groundwater supply than other designs of artificial turf fields because it affects mm -hmm. the water flow to the groundwater aquifer. So we probably want to get more than just the recreation to present. Oh, I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. I mean, those questions do have to come up. Um, but, absolutely. And what I do know about this, I, I know some about it, but not a whole lot about it. But I do know that so many communities have adopted turf fields that we have some advantage of actually going by at least some um, anecdotal and some uh, local information. I know some of the things that I heard about is that in the early days, the salesmen for these things were selling like a certain lifespan that might not have come to fruition. So I think we reach out to actually some of these surrounding communities and see what their true pros and cons have been uh, to these turf fields. I, I also could see it going either way. I'd be interested in actually seeing the actual information, hearing the actual information. Right. Even we will be presented with their actual proposal if they're ready. I mean, uh, right now it's more of a placeholder on the warrant until we were certain because if they're not fully prepared to present it this spring, they'll hold it off until they are. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so it sounds like we've uh, discussed that one. I'll move on to, um, which I have a question on, on like saying um, Article 13 from the, um, the Regional School Committee. Should that be part of the capital or why is that standalone and separate? Is it because it's regional? It's because it's under their own, Regional School Committee is its own entity. So it's always included as a separate article. Definitely. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Look, as I get this, as a generic capital expense, there's no details to it. I don't know if anyone knows what it is, or is that a placeholder? Mm -hmm. One thing that's not on here is any capital items for Pine Hill. I don't know if they don't have any this year or what, but usually one of the, I don't know, Diane, if you want to reach out to Don or Sharon, reach out to oh. Don and find out if Sherburn School Committee, because that's that usually is included in the capital items. And then art of the next articles, the region has their own article. But Capital, I don't see a placeholder for Pine Hill on here. Capital Budget Committee, Joe could answer Joe that. Could, yeah, Joe, Joe could, yeah. that's who I would talk to. Okay. So just a footnote on the, the region. Yeah. We used to do these uh, intermunicipal agreements that allowed us to fund things differently from the way Dover funds things. And I don't know whether that agreement is still in effect or whether it was one year agreements and so on. But it depends on the nature of the projects and what is uh, uh, the amount of money that's involved and so on. I just wanted to make a note of that so that when we consider the dollar amounts here, there also is the option of renewing that intermunicipal agreement with Dover that allows us to do these things differently. From my understanding, Paul, that's like an ongoing agreement. It's not one that expires or it has to be renewed each year but uh, we could we probably should look into it just to double check I, i'm pretty sure george is right because they you know we don't sit on five or six million dollars in free in free cash <laughs> unfortunately so the agreement right. usually works that we bond things and they pay for free cash <laughs> yes exactly but that's based on that agreement and i thought it was it may need to be looked at you're right right we should we should double check it but as jeff said i know from past experience on advisory that we've uh, bonded items that Dover pays for in cash. Our, we've bonded our share of items that Dover pays for in cash. Yes. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, next one. No, uh, item 14. Or, um, this is some advisory use of free cash. Should that be almost on their consent agenda? Um, well, we sometimes use free cash to pay for capital projects in some years. Yes, yeah, so I, I think it, that's, that's I think that's the reason why it follows the capital. Need a, need a two -thirds. A, Does it need a two thirds then? Well, Mary, are you still on here? Yes, I am. Um, t that article that far down in the warrant um, in the old days, um, that was often used to use free cash to lower the tax rate and you know, I don't think that that's looked upon as a great thing now by some of the financial people looking at this, at the town's finances. So 
we probably don't want to well i don't have an opinion obviously as a moderator <laughs> but i'm just i'm just i'm just saying that that was what it was used for before typically which does make me think of something so mary um we did, and really you did a great job last year of uh, really collecting some things since I, uh, numerous consent agendas, or at least kind of like grouping them together. And I think yes. um, after we do a kind of a discussion or, our, or whatever, a Saturday workshop on these, we'll probably look for the same thing. Cause that was a such a success, success last year. I'd love to see the same thing again this year. Yeah, I think, I think it's a great thing, particularly with the COVID because it enables you to move along on things that are probably going to get approved anyway, so. Absolutely. All right, uh, next one, 15 from the assessors. Okay, this goes my own ignorance. What's Revel Fund? Is that like revolving fund? Barry talked about that. Revaluation. Re I think it's the oh. reevaluation. I believe Wendy was on here earlier. I just well, I tried right. texting Diane before, so I didn't look stupid, but she didn't reply to me. So no, I guess yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I did. Wendy I'm, just uh, unmuted. Wendy just unmuted herself. Yes. Right. Wendy Alassi, Director of Assessing. Um, we are, this money is to fund our revaluation certification. Um, prior to this, um, it was a triennial certification. Now it's every five years. And we ask for the money a couple of years in advance. Um, so it's for an FY23 reval and um, we'll use, I'll, I'll actually be starting the process this summer. Um, so we need the money to, you know, to start early. Uh, can, okay. can I just have Diane or Jackie, uh, Jeannie change it to revaluation? Cause I had the same thing when I first looked at it as Eric, it's like what's reval funding? Is that like a, oh. a company you're gonna work with or something? <laughs> no, that's assessing talk. And no, I, that's I probably exactly how I, <laughs> yeah, revaluation. <laughs> How about revaluation certification? That's that perfect. that that's better. Yeah, that, revaluation better, certification. Better wording, so we don't. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yes. I was going to add an e, George, and have it be reveal funding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure we make that. I'll make sure we make that change tomorrow. Okay, and, thanks, and I guarantee you, because that's how I say it, a reval. I guarantee you when they asked about it, I probably sent them reval. So I apologize. No problem. Revaluation. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And then you have the next one too, Wendy, right? Yeah, adopt a law yes. to collect uh, tax data until um, until June 30th. Yes, and this is really exciting um, for, for an assessor. Um, if you want me to just explain it really briefly, I can. Yeah. Um, okay, so I don't, I wasn't prepared for this, but it's um, chapter, it's called chapter 653, section 40. It's an amendment to chapter 59, section 2A, which now that we're semi in, I mean, now that we're quarterly um, billing, we are able to, the, the, you know, it needs a legislative body vote to allow the assessor to collect and tax up until June 30. Our normal assessment date right now is how the property stood as of January 1st. This will allow me, for example, anything, all of Southfield, for example, I would have been able to tax properties that were built between January 1st and June 30th of last year and put them on the tax rolls for this year. So we're getting our money earlier. It's really good for the town. It will be a big boost for this year. I'd like it, you know, for it to hopefully be voted um, at town meeting and I'm going to collect and assess as though it is going to happen um, so that we can hit the ground running on July 1st and I can start the analysis and valuation. So I so don't, I'm sorry. I was gonna make a suggestion, a friendly sure. suggestion. Yep. Could we delete the word data in the description? Adopt law allowing the assessors to collect tax until June 30th, 
as opposed to having the word data in there. I think it's supposed to be the word date, not data. No, I think it's collect data and tax. Collect data and tax. Um, this is a very draft. I'm going to um, update and rewrite this whole article. Um, and if you'd like, I can, I was actually gonna just write it up, send it over to Chris Petrini, have him review it, make sure. And then I could send it to you um, if you'd like to see it before I actually submit it. Um, so it's a very rough draft, but it allows me to collect data um, and tax on July 1st. So it will be much more detailed than what you're looking at. And I'm so sorry, I don't have everything in front of me, but. No, thank it, you certainly for an overview, which we, and then we'll be ready and when it gets presented in greater detail. Yes, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's good for the town. I can't imagine um, people would be opposed to it. And um, yeah, it's a no I'm excited. Yeah, it's a no brainer and I'm, I'm excited. So Sounds like another, potential move, another potential move to consent agenda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, absolutely. And next will be uh, Jackie Morris uh, for number 17 uh, to amend uh, GBL5. Is it GBL or MGL? Uh, I guess GBL53 for uh, registration and license requirements. I think it's GBL because it's general bylaws, right? General yes. bylaws. Uh, is Jackie on? Yeah, I'm here. Did you want me to comment on it? Um, I, I, um, I, I just wanted to make the bylaw about the fine and, and when licenses would do a little more clear. And I just think March 1st is, um, is, a, is a better date for residents to remember and also just clarify because um, a lot of times the dates fall on the weekends. So I just want to clarify that if March 1st falls on a weekend, that the the last day to without the fine would be the you know the first business day of the week coming. So it's just and also for renewals, it's for renewals. A lot of people think that they have to pay the fine when they have a new puppy because they didn't get their puppy before you know <laughs> the date. So that that's all. It's it's a very simple, just kind of just um, cleaning up the bylaw. That's all. That's all it is. Another potential consent agenda. Very good. Um, <laughs> number nineteen. Um, this sounds, sounds sounds like it might be a, a little. Um, that's right. We talked about this. We a talked little about bit. this last time. Yeah. Um, amendment to frontage requirement for open space subdivisions. I remember that. And this is one where, I mean, once you go to an open face space subdivision, since you're limited to what you could actually build on a regular subdivision. I personally am kind of, an, you know, I could give a fair amount of latitude to the actual, um, what do you call it, uh, geometry of a lot, I think a fair amount, because if, you know, you can only build nine, you only build nine. So who cares how they're shaped? At least that's my thought on this. I don't know if, uh, is Gino on here or else? I mean, we did talk we, about we it. Already discussed, we discussed it with him yeah. like last yeah, meeting. We talked about it. Yep. I don't know if there's any thoughts on that, but, you know, that's my opinion. Uh, next one is a uh, floodplain district. We talked about that. And that's one where Paul talked about where maybe you put on hold for a year because there was something kind of um, fishy about it. Yes, I thought Gino agreed. So yeah. the FEMA thing. The one. I mean, we have to vote to withdraw it. I'm not sure what the, what the logistics of that is. We have to vote to withdraw it, David said, but I don't think um, Gino's on, so we probably shouldn't do it without Gino. Yeah, why don't we do it next week when we're gonna vote on all what the whole warrant, what we're including? Not, yeah. we're, not that we're voting to approve the war, but like the our, our articles that we're including. So if we do it next week, we could vote to take that one out at the same time we're voting that the other ones are included. Now, if the planning board article, does the, does the select board just simply like vote to like endorse it or not? Or do we actually sponsor it and we have the power to pull it out? You know what well, I mean? We vote whether we support the articles down the road, like when we go to the advisory hearing. Right now, we're saying we vote to what to see what's included in the warrant. Yep. I go to me. But Correct. our old articles, we can actually pull out, like, you know what I mean, versus this, oh, I see what you're saying. I don't right. think we can pull planning board articles, can we? That's what I'm saying. That's kind of my question. Paul, can we pull planning board articles or can they put on whatever they want? I think there was agreement. Uh, Marion Neutra was there also, I think, at the meeting. No, so but I'm saying I'm... in general, 
should the planning board put articles on that we don't have any say whether it's on the warrant or not? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Well, we voted to accept this list as it is right now. We can modify that with another vote. Right. All right, well, I, anyways. Um, we'll talk in more detail, I think, next week. Next week's gonna be dedicated to this. This is a good, this is a preview, call it. Yeah. On uh, next one, 21, we did talk about this last week, Council of Aging, Feasibility Study for Location of a Senior Center. We're gonna okay. blend uh, that uh, with yeah. the earlier one, I think. With the capital one, yeah. yeah. Yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about 22, 23. Is this a placeholder uh, for us to prohibit use of compression engine slash brakes usage and in, in within the town limits? That probably should not be consent agenda. Who's who's the that's a who's the sponsor of that one? This this shows the select board being the sponsor. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that yeah. actually is a resident that brought that forward, yeah. Jeff, and he's hoping that the select board will bring it. You know, will sponsor mm. it. I think. Oh, are they going to come and present something to us? I don't. Um, well, I'm having people come in at the next meeting. Okay. Some Warren article people to come in. So I'm hoping that he'll be there for that. Yeah, so just leave it there for now and we'll see what they say and then decide okay. from there. Hmm. All right. The final couple here are our citizens uh, committee. Um, first one is adding new uh, general bylaw, chapter 31, ban the sale of new fur products in the town of Sherbin. So if they have the more than 10 signatures, it has to be on the warrant. So right. it per, for purposes of this discussion, they have to be on. Right. Yep. Get that. This be interesting if they, you know, talk about it at the as someone uh, represents it, perhaps at a uh, next week's meeting. And then uh, citizen uh, committee adding new general bylaw chapter thirty two, ban the resale retail sale of dogs, cats, or rabbits in pet shops in the town of Sherburn. Do we have any pet shops in the town of Sherburn? No, I think pet shop. But you know, what we do they have like farms, and that's that's where I can kind of see a loophole. So what if a farm sells a goat or something? You know, it doesn't say that. Our farm could sell a rabbit. You can totally see one of the farm selling well, a rabbit. I mean, the one out on Coolidge, they sell chicks. They sell chickens and yeah. cats. Cats all the time. Do they sell cats? Absolutely. Uh, I don't know that. Yeah. So I mean, whether that uh, fits the definition of pet shop or not. Um, heck, that one in uh, Natick, right over the line, that's now condos. I gave free kittens in the last few couple of years. Do so. Do we have actual language on these? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, Diane, do you know? No, we don't. I don't think we have actual language on it. I think it needs to go to council to review what they put on their warrant when they went to get their signatures. All right. Most towns tell me is well, in my role as town council not to write citizen articles. Mm -hmm. They rise or fall on what the voters have signed. So mm -hmm. if they don't have language to define what is a pet shop or not a pet shop, it's not the role of town council to create the bylaw. Well, there is some language that they did submit with the signatures. So the, I'll bring that forward at the next meeting too. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's Very good. what I was asking. Okay. Well, that's it. Throughout, uh, that's a preview of town meeting. Um, are there any, there any questions on it? Are there any articles that we think should be added that's not on this list? There was one I got an email a while ago, and I was going to um, see if there was follow up. It might be a, there was about a, a banning of plastic bags in the town of Sherbin. So that's another one. Yeah, a number of my towns have done that. Yeah. The problem with plastic bags is that the wind catches them and blows them, and it does terrible things in the ocean to okay. fish and wildlife. And, and even not in the ocean, like the birds and stuff like that around here, around yep. terrestrial. The only thing is, remember, during the pandemic, they sort of suspended that in a lot of places because people couldn't use the reusable bags because of the pandemic concerns, I think. Just, you know, I got a text from Diane and good dive text from Gino that um, they're going to pull the, uh, the floodplain article. So just a little preview there. Okay. All right. That's it. That's it for that one there. Uh, we'll move on to um, uh, agenda item number eight. Uh, Department of Space Needs. Um, it sounds almost like a, a building council of aging inspired thing. I know we probably follow up <laughs> on the discussion we had before. Uh, who's taking the lead on this? Is this a Sean thing? Jeff, I think it was you, right? Oh, was it Jeff? Okay. No, I don't think I... Well, we talked about, I think yeah. you and I talked about, Jeff, having 
a group of people get together, like I know it was COA, mm -hmm. it was the Historical Society, it was oh. the library, the community center. I think we wanted to try to get a large group of people to discuss, and Sean, uh, as the buildings court, you know, that we need to discuss what the best use of all the spaces are and what the needs are for additional space. I think, so what's going on there? You're right, George, I forgot that. Um, I think the COA article will cover the majority of that. And I think the library has a sub team working on the museum space right now. We could add someone to oh, that okay. if you want. So on the museum space, they've created a sub team of three or four library people and uh, three or four historical society people to look at that space. Okay. And so, then, so has there been any discussion with the community center about that? Not yet. Or, we'll no? we'll okay. need to do that, but that will probably revolve around the COA project. I think that's one of the things we'll have to, you and I talked about that last time when the COA was presenting. I think that will have to be addressed. And it relates to the CO, the um, lease is coming up also for the community center with the town, the, the foundation uh, lease. Mm -hmm comes up i forget i think it's next year on the museum piece jeff i think that my recollection is that when salt and stall made his gift he required that the museum have space in the library as one of the conditions of the gift so there may not be the flexibility to put the museum anywhere we want i think it's required as a condition of the funding for the library that it be in the library but it was always at town hall before so now we're proposing moving it to the library yeah so um let me just go back i you're i think you're partially right paul but it was actually the original Dows in 19 whatever 15 george fisk can explain this to us george yeah. turned on his camera, which i'm gonna take as meaning as he wants to speak <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I want to. And if he doesn't but, <laughs> want to, I know Margo can because she's on too. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll, I'll try to give a brief on this. <clears throat> it is not the Saltonstall family. It's a fellow by the name of William Bradford Homer Douse. And he was uh, a, a person of note in Sherburne uh, back at the turn of the last century. <clears throat> and um, and as, as I think you all know, the Douse family dates back many, many years in Sherburne. But William Bradford Homer Douse made a gift to the town of the Douse Library, which was the library that was in use when I was a youngster and, and was really up until um, the Saltonstall family was was kind enough to build a new library for the town. Uh, but <clears throat> when the gift was made in 1913 and 14 by uh, Mr. Douse, it was coincident with the um, the founding of the Historical Society, uh, of, and, and he had an interest in that enough so that there was a provision in the gift to the town that the town would provide space for the Historical Society Museum within that library. And that's where it um, stayed um, for many, many years. And it really wasn't until the town office moved to what I think of as Center School, and that's where you all are now, um, where the town office is. The museum was moved to that location, and that was in the 1980s. Um, initially to the second floor and then ultimately to the lower level where it remained until early last June. And we all know about COVID and what happened, but the fact of the matter is the town has a responsibility to the uh, Historical Society to provide space. And um, what I had suggested soon after we made the move, because it was, we were, the indication was that that we would be moving out of the town office and relocated into the library space, into the library building. And of course we know they've, the library has had its issues trying to get that, recon, that, um, that new construction completed. And we all, I think, recognize the need to get that done. Uh, in any event, there was a, a group uh, put together that consisted of um, me and Margot Powicki and uh, Martha Mahard. The three of us are all board members of the Historical Society. And um, <clears throat> we wanted to work with representatives of the library and we've done so since last summer. 
and that consists of Brian Conley um, as chair of the library board. Chris Kenny has been on it, and um, uh, and we have Aaron we Carroll. did meet. Pardon me. Aaron Carroll also. And Aaron Carroll was the uh, third the third member of the uh, library board um, who was on that committee as well. And we met, I think, beginning probably in August um, and uh, worked through the fall. And uh, what's we, we've talked about what we might, what our needs were. We've been talking with the library about a space that we felt would work well for us. Um, it essentially is space that was not part of the new construction. Uh, for one reason, we couldn't do that anyway. That would run counter to the agreement with the state but there was a space of about 2,500 square feet that's in the basement level of the currently existing library that was first given by the Salton Stalls in 1971. And um, that all looks pretty good, except that um, there are other considerations that are being made now. And that is that the library is looking at other, um, other needs that they may very well have and might need uh, some of the same space area that we had been looking at. So that's where the discussion continues. But I think it's, um, I think it's fair to say that we're all in agreement that what's, what's of primary importance right now is to make sure that the library itself gets, the construction gets completed. And then subsequent to that, one would hope that we would be able to have an arrangement that's mutually satisfactory that allows us to move into the library. And I see Brian Conley, who's obviously worked with me on this and Vicki Rallis, some others have some hands up. So I'll stop there. All right, does anyone else wanna speak on this, uh, on this matter? Said some hands are up. Are the virtual hands, am I missing them on the right? Yeah, Brian Vicky Conley. Vicki and Brian are both have their hands up. Yeah, Brian, I have the top of my list here, Brian, so. Uh, Thanks, yep. Eric. Uh, and I think George described it uh, pretty accurately of what we've done. Um, and what we've done over the last probably six weeks within the library is really look at, so the library had kind of informally allowed uh, historically the Council on Aging, the Garden Club, and also the Friends of the Library to use space in the library. So uh, we're doing a prioritization exercise of space within the library, including space that we had intended for makerspace and storage space as well as to outside parties. And what, to George's point, I think what we really need to try to, what we're trying to get to is how much space does the historical society need? How much is available? And what are the priorities within the library? And just see kind of what the, you know, if you think of that as a kind of a Venn diagram, what, what how we could coexist with the proper amount of space. So we've got a little bit more work to do on that, but that's the approach we're taking. And, and Vicki, who is uh, just joined the library trustee board about uh, two months ago has also joined in on that. And she's kind of, the, what I just described, she's kind of driving that effort with Aaron uh, to really try to have a, a kind of an analysis, a kind of impartial analysis of what the space needs are. Well, I saw Vicki put her hand down. I don't know if she wants to see, uh, put it down. I won't call you. Uh, Brian um, covered everything well. I don't need to add anything. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, any other comments on that? Yeah. I think oh, I kind thank of. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we can also call it is a work in progress. And you can tell that there, there are uh, demands to uh, needs right now. And I think it's a discussion that uh, needs to continue. Uh, okay, if that's it, Matt, uh, we have our uh, closing agenda item number nine, um, just administration items and routine business. Uh, I showed something here about um, select board goals and review. I don't know if um, is that Jeff? Yeah, I, I didn't resend them. So maybe we should do that in two weeks. Uh, I, 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 you know, completed all the edits I got, but we didn't end up voting that night. So I didn't okay. resend them earlier this week. So why don't we move that to the, whatever it is, the 4th of March. Okay. We'll move forward or we'll actually, we'll March 4th in that date. We did, we, we, we accomplished one already with the face. I, I caught that, Eric. So. That was very good. <laughs> We we accomplished we, we accomplished one partially tonight on the police chief search. So we were working yeah, on our goals. We did. I was very happy with the progress we made at the previous on uh, the previous meeting. Absolutely. Um, any other select board reports? 
in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the only one I did comment on it sooner, just about the passing a bond, transportation bond bill included a potential um, $100 million for um, roadway improvements um, for um, municipal owned roads that are state numbered route. And I think Sherman could take advantage of that. I think we're well positioned. Oh, sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, no, that's just that. That's the only thing I was going to report on, just to keep our eye out on that, um, see if that gets executed in FY um, in FY twenty two. Yeah, just to just to reiterate, you did mention our meeting earlier, and a lot of people weren't on here at that point. But just to recap, the the police uh, chief search committee did vote tonight to hire a consultant. We conducted interviews with two firms, and clearly thought one was superior, and decided to pursue working with them. So I think we're making progress and, and on, on that front. I just wanted to report that as the chair of that committee. Yeah, very good. Um, any uh, any staff reports? Anything from either a finance director, assistant town administrator, not to put you on the spot. I don't, ha- I don't have anything, George. I don't know about- um, that's, Eric, that's Eric, that's the chair, not Diane. Oh, I'm, so, <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> no, it's only, it's only the second time you've done it tonight. So I'll, let's take it as a- <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't have, I don't have anything. Maybe Sharon does, but I don't. I let us uh, like yeah. first time. Just two quick updates. I did send an email to everybody. Um, uh, the certification of our free cash and Schedule A is imminent. It's been in the we've had our data to them for about two weeks now, and I I guess they're just really bogged down. But hopefully, we'll hear tomorrow. Um, and I did send you uh, an estimate of what what I thought that would be. Um, and the other thing is I just wanted to let you know that I am going to be working closely with David and all the department budget makers on creating an IT budget. And hopefully I'll have that to present at the next um, select board meeting. Very good. I had a question. I don't know if it's for you or if it's for Wendy or, or Huma or maybe even the collector um, for Pam. Uh, but um, given that over this last year, um, houses in rural areas or houses in Sherman have been you know, selling have been increasing and selling higher and there's been a fair amount of turnover. Do we think, uh, have any projection of that'll do on our tax revenue for next year? That's a Wendy question, I think. Yeah. Wendy, you're still, yeah, Wendy's still here. Kind of <clears throat> I'm still here. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, looking, looking at the um, current market, there will be increases um, in some properties. There was, um, 692 homes this year that increased in value. Um, and, you know, so for all of the sales for fiscal, uh, for calendar year 20, I will use in my analysis for 22. So the sales that are taking place now won't be used until 23. Okay. Um, I do, uh, yeah, so I do see an increase and I'm already predicting, um, and it's actually a conservative number of about three hundred thousand dollars in new growth. Um, and then there is another um, there's another topic I needed to discuss with the select board. Um, I don't know if you want to get into it tonight. Um, <clears throat> it would take me probably about five minutes to explain um, about I mean- some potential growth. For the town. I wouldn't mind a short thing, but we can't discuss it. You know, if it's if it's through discussion, it has to be a standalone agenda item. But if it's worth especially discussing later, I wouldn't mind hearing a brief synopsis of something that at least we can think about. Yes, yeah, so it's very brief. So um, the Department of Revenue has changed their guidelines for utility companies and their valuation. Um, so for towns that were in certification year, there were 71 towns. Um, they were directed to have their utilities valued. And when I'm saying utilities, we have NSTAR Electric and NSTAR Gas. So those are our two utility accounts. Um, the town is to have those independently appraised and no, no longer use the net book value, but to actually use full fair cash value. 
so what will happen is um, for fiscal 22, 71 communities, there were, they saw a 46% increase in their valuation. Right now, and this is again, just off the top of my head, um, right now our utilities are assessed at 19,116,000. <clears throat> so I ran the numbers and if we got say the 46%, which is the standard, we would be bringing in an additional um, valuation of 8,700, which would bring in approximately $170,000 in taxes. That being said, um, we are asked, we are being asked to increase our overlay because the towns that have taxed are, they're being challenged. It's already been successfully for the side of the assessor. Um, we re received a favorable um, a fav favorable action. And so we don't know why they are, these utility companies are bringing it back to the ATB because they've already lost cases. Um, but I think they're going to try to elevate it. Paul, I don't know if you've heard about this or not. Um, so what we'll have to do is we will have to retain, we may have to give the $172,000 back and we won't know until litigation is over whether we have to or not. So we're going to have to somehow create a separate fund to hold that money. There's one other caveat with personal property. You, or the utility companies or any personal property account only has to pay 50% of their third quarter actual bill. So we will get half of the taxes owed or three quarters. So we'll get um, preliminary first quarter, second quarter and third quarter, but we will not get fourth quarter. So we'll end up with, let's just say $125,000 in payment that we may have to, if we, if, if it was lost on a state level, we would have to refund. So, it, you know, it, it's complicated. I'd love to, you know, call it new growth. And, but so that's essentially, um, what's happening but i thought you guys should know about it um because i'm sure the topic's going to come up i've already spoken with steven Sai, and um we are not they do not want us to consider it new growth in the budget because then if we have to give it back it's going to really you know cause a hardship to the town so aren't you glad you asked mm -hmm. so if yeah, i could just Add a couple of things to that. Uh, sure. First, the last time I looked, uh, we're talking about the largest taxpayer in the town. Yes, we are. And the, the second point I'd make is that the uh, litigation process only starts at the appellate tax board, but it, it, from the appellate tax board, they have a right to go through the whole court system. To the SJC, yes, yes, so they could elevate so, it. And so they, they're they not willing to give up on, on the yeah. losses they've incurred so far because they wanna go the whole way. Yeah. The third thing is that, is that that's why you have an overlay surplus that where you have, where you are anticipating the need to make adjustments on money received. Yeah. It should be put into the overlay surplus. Yes. That's what resides. So uh, the, the way it should be accounted for in terms of our books is that it should be recorded as additional new growth, but it, it should then be offset by a larger overlay surplus by the amount of the anticipate, let's say it's 170,000. Yeah. Overlay surplus should be increased by 170,000. 
that's yes. not the correct way to account for it. Yes, yes. So that's that's how we'll do it. And they actually changed the Mass General Law a few years ago. Prior to this, um, your overlay, if you had existing abatements, say an abatement for fiscal 17, you could only take from the line item of fiscal 17. Now it's it's one bucket. So we do have some surplus anyway, which is good. And then on top of the 142 we have this year. So we may not have to do the entire 125,000, which is good. So I just have to run those numbers and Sharon and I will get together and take a look at those. But thank you. All right. That. And, you know, as this evolves, I think we will do a standalone um, agenda item on this. It sounds like it's very, very interesting. It sounds like something's coming through. But I do know, and also in the administration, that the utility companies do have a fair amount of influence on a, um, a lot of stuff there. I don't know if um, the Lawrence incident has maybe like weakened that in some fashion. Maybe they thought they're getting away with too much. But um, whatever else will be interesting to see us, particularly utility companies in Sherbin, um, where we have what do we have two transmission um, easements? Yes. I mean, so, right. So we have two utilities, right. So they're called the, their the personal property 504. We have two of them. Um, we have to, it's $2,500 per account for them to be, um, evaluate, you know, to be valued. And, um, you know, so I had to ask for 5,000 in my budget for this year, but yes, yeah, so it's two accounts um, and hopefully will prevail in a few years <laughs> when this, you know, but it, it does cause, you know, some trouble for us. So I just want to make sure we're protected. I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, the utility company makes a real yeah. impact on Sherman because those transmission lines are largely not to the direct benefit of the community but also for the region and for other communities. Whereas I think utility companies presence in other communities is simply pipes under the ground or under the roadway which directly provide benefit to those residents. Either way, I don't want to get into a huge detail with an agenda item. Does anyone else have right. anything official or quick about this? All right, I probably do want to move on to some extent there. Thank you so much though, Wendy. Uh, that's- um, Oh, thank you. And sorry, again, I wasn't prepared, so- um, I did my best. <laughs> no, no. And this is, a, again, this is just simply a report. And I consider yeah. a preview for some more detail. And it is interesting. I think it's very interesting. It is very interesting. Yes. You know, I, if, if you can't tell, I deal with utility companies in my day job. I was on I know. <laughs> a governor appointed committee that looked at the, some of the restoration requirements they had to do. And people understand how, how, I consider they're, they're tightly re uh, regulated on prescribed thing, but yet they can, there's a fair amount of latitude that they're given and a lot of exceptions to so many rules and regulations that- um, Yes, yes. And when you look at it, the net book value 50-50, you know, replacement costs new, less to pre, I mean, it's it just, they really are um, not paying full fair cash. And that's what assessors need to do, you know, need to tax us. So, okay, Absolutely. thank you. All right, um, any other reports? So, okay. So I guess, um, what is it? I know I've done this many times. Um, I'll take a mo, actually, here's it. So do we, have, do we have to move to close this meeting? I can't remember and then open an executive. Did you move to move to adjourn to executive session? Yeah. My brain is fried. We'll see how I do an executive. Yeah. Me too, All right. I'm so, with you, Eric. So for the um, for the agenda items as previously read by Diane, the assistant town administrator, I as chair do deem that a executive session is warranted, and I move so uh, to move into such an executive session. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Um, all in favor? Jeff. Aye. Uh, George. Aye. Uh, Paul. Aye. And I am I as well. 